Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. Romans chapter 12 today. If you take your Bibles and join me there, Romans chapter number 12. Uh, no promises, but today, Lord willing, we will complete Romans 12. Again, no promises, so don't hold me to that, okay? But Romans chapter number 12. We've intended to finish it for the last 37 weeks, but hopefully today we will complete Romans chapter 12. How many of you remember getting into a fight when you were a kid with a sibling because they encroached upon the line that was clearly there in the back seat of the car? How many of you ever had a parent say, what's going on back there? And then someone said, they're on my side of the seat. How many of you have ever had that? How many of you had that this morning, as a matter of fact? Okay. A few of you actually <laughs> acknowledge. And you know, there's something about this line. Now, I know today we have, um, we have in a lot of vehicles, there are those bucket seats. You know, like the minivans have these bucket seats. How many of you have still found the kids find some reason to find discomfort, although they have their own seat in the back of a van. Now, when you used to have those bench seats, now woe unto the family that had more than two children sitting in the back, and even more woe, greater woe, woe unto you if you had to sit in the middle of that bench seat. And there was just some known line that you were not supposed to cross, and we would say they crossed the line. Well, today we're going to look at some line that is found not necessarily in Scripture, but certainly found in our minds. It seems as we grow older, we may not have all the same challenges of someone encroaching upon our space in the backseat of a car, but we're experiencing still some similar challenge. Someone has encroached upon my rights. They have said something. They did something. They insinuated something. They crossed the line. And we don't have any space in our lives for what they just did. There is no room for that here. The title of our message today is Making Room for Your Enemies. Your Bibles are open right now to Romans chapter 12. Let's begin reading today in verse number 17. Romans 12, beginning in verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Just by brief way of review from the message that we preached from Romans 12 last week, we remember that the distinguishing mark of the Christian faith is love. The distinguishing mark of the Christian faith is love. The Bible says it this way, John chapter 13, verse 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. We also remember that there are always believers who seem to be looking for a fight. This is not just true in the world that exists outside of the church, certainly it exists there. Sadly, it appears that it also exists within the framework of the body of Christ. So we know that there are four ways of responding. 
but only one of them sets us apart as being followers of Jesus Christ. And it's the only response that demands a supernatural supply. So let's ask our question today, what happens when we respond with good for evil? What are the things that are set in motion when we do something that God is commanding us to do? Okay, we're not supposed to respond with with simply evil for evil because that's what they did to me. Okay, when I live now on a different supernatural level, what are the things that start to to come into motion? Well, the first thing that we're going to notice today is we begin to disarm our enemies. We begin to actually remove the weapons from their arsenal. We start to take the ammunition from the weapon. We start to disarm our enemies. The Bible says again, Romans chapter 12, verse number 14, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Okay, the word bless here is an interesting word. It's the Greek word eulogeo. We get the word eulogize from. Now, some of you are thinking, oh, good, like their funeral. We get, no, 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 we're not talking about that. What we're talking about here is we're talking about pouring blessing, pouring kindness, this overflow of goodness upon the person who has done you wrong to bless, to eulogize, to pour out upon them some good thing, bless them which persecute you, eulogize, bless, and curse not. The epitome of this practice is demonstrated by the one who navigated life perfectly. At the very height of human injustice, the climax of evil against good, which was the crucifixion of Jesus, The one wronged does this. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Jesus pours out upon them the epitome of the blessing of forgiveness. Father, forgive them. The height of of light against darkness the height of evil against perfect good. And what is it that Jesus demonstrates? He demonstrates something that is disarming. This is the example that you and I are called to to follow. Notice how the apostle Peter explains what we are to do. He said it this way, for even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now, before you start to think, well, okay, well, that was Jesus. I mean, I know Jesus always does everything perfectly, but we're not him. How how can Sinful people like us do that which is perfectly God-like because Jesus is God. Well, before you think it's not humanly possible, I would submit it's not humanly possible, but it is humanly attainable through the filling of the Spirit of God. And people have practiced, lived the example that Jesus set. He had preached the gospel He had given people that which they so desperately needed. But they respond with evil for good. What does he do? He actually begins to disarm his enemies. Now, he may not have seen it immediately, but there was one standing there, one approving to all that's taking place, whose name was Saul of Tarsus. He had his own you know, weapons in hand. He had letters, you know, to to seek and to destroy those that were followers of this way. And what is it that Stephen, the first of the deacons, says? What is it that happens with him? Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, Lay not this sin to their charge. 
And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Of whom are we reminded when Stephen says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. We're reminded of the one who said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What is it that Stephen is doing? He is blessing those who persecute him. And guess what he's doing? He's actually disarming, removing the weaponry from the hands of the enemy. You say he still died. True, he did. Oh, but the seed that was now planted. The Apostle Paul said it this way. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse number 17, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. The way we would use the word recompense today is no paybacks. Okay, sometimes as kids we use that expression. Someone does something, we say paybacks. We do back to them what they have initially started with us. And the Apostle Peter would go on and say it this way, 1 Peter 3, 9. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. The word rendering here in 1 Peter, same word as recompense. The word blessing, same word as eulogeo, to eulogize. So when someone slanders you, you speak a blessing upon them. And it is the blessing rather than the slander that is your inheritance. Do you remember when Paul and Silas are singing at midnight? This is after they had been beaten. Then the earthquake and the, 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 the prison doors open and the jailer is about to fall on his sword. Humanly speaking, we might stand back and say, fine. Now, he's about to get his just desserts. That's exactly what he deserves. And yet, what is it that Paul and Silas render to him again? They render to no man evil. The stripes on their back, the, the, the still bleeding wounds. Wait! And he comes trembling. It, it may have been a sword that he had held in his hand, but now he realizes as the, the doors are open, there's no way for me to recover the, 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 the inmates. There's no way for me to regain the prisoners. And maybe in that prison, you could have heard the sword clank on the floor. They had disarmed now their enemy. And he comes and he offers the words, what must I do to be saved? How is this accomplished? It's accomplished when we are rendering to no man evil for evil, when we bless those that persecute you, bless and curse not. He goes on, and notice the expression before we pass it by, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Provide things honest in the sight. It means we're to give ourselves, we're to give consideration for how others view our actions. We're to give consideration, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Okay, pause then. How is this going to be perceived? Am I trying to agitate? Am I trying to, to do a little poke here? How are my actions going to be seen by others? Do you know, we live in a day that is rather unique. We live in a day where we understand the beauty of the grace of God. But sometimes we've taken that to a level where we say, you know, it doesn't matter what other people think. I'm just living my life under the grace of God. He says, wait just a minute. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. People are watching they're evaluating our actions. Essentially, what, what he's saying, the thought that's embedded in this verse, is that the true believer in Christ will seek to be as outwardly attractive as they are inwardly holy. We're to live in such a way where we are as outwardly attractive. You say, well, there's not a lot here to work with. You know what I'm saying. That we're reflecting something of Jesus Christ to be as outwardly pleasing as we are inwardly holy. Well, they, they just have to take me as I am. Well, well, really, provide things honest in the sight of all men. People are watching, so live in such a way where they see the reality of what's inside. He is saying it does actually matter what other people think. Well, all that from we disarm our enemies. Let's, let's make up some time. The next thing that we see here is this. We make room for our enemies. 
We took the title of our message today from this point. We make room for our enemies. Romans chapter 12, verse number 19. Notice what it says. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Retaliation is not yours to worry about. We no longer have to keep score. That score belongs to God. Have you ever said something like this to your spouse? Oh, so you want to bring that up? Okay, then let's talk about the time that you, and then we start to run through. You say, well, I never say that. Well, are you thinking it? Oh, so you want to bring that up? Well, I could name this, 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 and this that you have done. Do you know what we're doing in our mind is we are replaying the score count. We're we're rereading the script that we have so carefully written. When we live to retaliate, we are essentially putting ourselves in the place of God. Joseph recognized that although humanly speaking, retaliation was expected he was not the person who would do the avenging retaliation was expected and interestingly enough it wasn't just expected from the bystander of the whole situation retaliation was expected by those who had done him wrong they're thinking well you know he has every right to do something to us in response to what we have done to him But instead, Joseph made room for his enemies. The Bible says, Genesis chapter 50, verse number 19, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? Joseph knew that vengeance belongs to God, not man. So we now take note of that little expression, give place unto wrath. It simply means this, make room for the wrongdoing of others. Make room for the wrongdoing of others. They have done me wrong. I know, but I have some room for that. It's simply preparing yourself in advance for what will eventually come your way. Okay, when I was 12 years old, my, um, my grandfather unexpectedly passed. In fact, we had been to their apartment earlier that evening Um, As a family, I'd had a wipeout, a a wonderful wipeout on my bike earlier that day. And so I cut up my, my, my shoulder, my elbow, my wrist, and my grandfather put my arm in a bandana sling. As a 12 year old, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world, you know. So I'm walking around with this sling, and grandpa had patched me up. And, and late that night, my grandfather entered eternity. He had a heart attack, and and the Lord called him home. Well, my grandmother had very severe rheumatoid arthritis. She was quite an amazing woman. She she was a a, a person that had taught uh, years ago in a one-room schoolhouse and and just a remarkable woman, but very severe rheumatoid arthritis. So I started to stay with my grandmother quite often and just to help and to care and and they lived a couple blocks away from us. So dad and mom said, hey, listen, we're, we're going to build a room onto our home where, where grandma can come live with us. So that's what they did. My dad started to prepare. And, and dad, uh, he, j- he built a room. He added on a room. He did most of all the construction himself. And us kids would help out. But, but they made room. And, and now someone came and they anticipated grandma's coming. So we had to add a room onto the house. Well, do you know what the apostle is actually saying? He's saying, okay, anticipate. You know something's coming. Now some of you have a guest room in your home. You have a guest room because you know there are guests coming. We have room for those guests when they come. And so we call it a guest room, a place for guests when they come to stay in our home. He's not saying anything more than this. He's saying, okay, here's the deal. There are going to be bad things that happen in your life. Have you got any room for that? All right, now let's go back to, let's, let's go back to what we opened with, the kids on the seat in the back of the car. 
And there is a line. And woe to the sibling that crosses the line. I mean, you're going to have a little World War III, and you're going to have the, the statement, do I need to pull this car? Okay, that kind of a thing, all right? Why is that? Because someone crossed the line, and I'll tell you why it's so bothersome, because they don't have any room for that. I got no room for someone coming over on this side of the... Do you know what starts to happen in the mind and in the life of the person who has no room for any wrongdoing in their life, who cannot give place unto wrath? Do you know what happens to that person? There's no room for any wrongdoing. I mean, none. Nobody's going to treat you at the checkout counter like they just treated you. You don't have any room for that. Nobody's going to treat you on the highway in a way that is going to say, hey, nobody treats me like that. No child will speak to you, no coworker, no employer, no employee. Nobody is going to talk to you that way because I don't have any room for that. I got no room for that. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, make some room for it. Do you know the person who makes no room not only is going to be frustrated when wrath comes their way, they're going to find any opportunity for wrath to come their way. They're going to take offense at almost anything, even when none is intended. Have you ever gone to the grocery store? How many of you have ever done this? How many of you have ever gone to the grocery store to just pick up one or two items? Have you ever done that? And, um, and you didn't pick up a cart, right? So you just went to get a couple things, and, and then, oh, yeah, I remembered. And so you got those couple things, and then did you have to get a couple more things? How many of you have ever gotten a couple things, and then you went back and got one of those carry baskets? Have you ever done that? How many of you have ever gotten a couple things, and you don't have room, so you put it in the carry basket, and then you don't have room in the carry basket? Now you're, you're carrying things in the basket, and you're carrying... Have you ever not gotten a basket and then gotten a basket and then gotten a basket and then gotten a, how many of you have ever gotten a cart? Have you ever done that? And then before you know it, could you push this other cart and you're going out with the whole thing? Do, do you know what he's saying? He's saying, hey, come on now. How big is the room that you have? Well, I, I, I just carry the wrong things that come my way. No, you, you better go pick up a basket. And you know what you're going to find? If you pick up a little basket, why not just get a cart, Okay. And if you get a cart, I mean, seriously, why not just get one of those big flat things that you're, you know. How big is the room that you have right now for wrath? How big is the room? How big is the room, so to speak, that Jesus demonstrated who is our example? Some of us don't even have a handbasket amount of space for wrongdoing that may come our way. We say, well, they just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. I, I mean, I handled it for a while, but that's it. Well, how big is your room? When we make room for the wrong, we are giving place unto wrath. In many ways, you are simply making room for your enemies. When, when we don't make room for wrongdoing, we find reasons to live offended. Have you ever met a person that they're just offended by everything? Everything bothers them. Everything frustrates them. They find offense everywhere they're looking. Do you know what I, I conclude personally is, is when that happens to me, I have a very small, maybe not even a handbasket room for wrongdoing. Then the verse reminds us that God said, vengeance is mine. Vengeance doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to you. So don't worry about it. Don't fret over it. Don't waste your mental energy on, well, they're doing this, and vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. You just roll that over on him. Hey, how many of you last night lost sleep over Dr. Zacharias's mortgage payment? I'm looking right now, so, okay, so apparently none. <laughs> well, that makes sense to us, right? The reason you don't worry about that is that's not yours to pay. It's not yours to take care of. It's not your responsibility. And you know, we oftentimes lose a lot of sleep over the wrongdoing that someone else has done to us. But if we would realize, oh, that's not mine. I don't have to take care of that. 
I'm not the one who has to say, okay, what am I going to do? To re- That's not ours to do. Don't lose any sleep over that. that. That payment, so to speak, belongs to someone else. Vengeance is mine. I'll take care of that, Jesus says. Vengeance is mine. I'll repay, saith the Lord. And who has the better ability to respond justly to what needs to be done than God? Look at the the next one that we see here. We not only see we disarm our enemies, we make room for our enemies. The third thing I see is we prepare the way for future opportunity and reconciliation. We prepare the way, future opportunity. Listen, I don't want to close an opportunity for gospel advancement in the lives of others. I, I want some future opportunity and we want some future reconciliation. Romans 12, 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Remember, our goal is not to seek our enemy's shame, but rather to demonstrate the sincerity of our love. That's why we feed him when he's hungry. It's why when he's thirsty, we give him drink. A Christianity that does more than simply withhold vengeance and moves to active benevolence is a Christianity that is preparing the way for Christ, even to our enemies. A Christianity, okay, it withholds vengeance, and now it activates benevolence. This is a Christianity that is now living before people the reality of the gospel. What was it the centurion, who was part of the crucifixion of Christ, had to say of the one who prayed for his forgiveness? Father, forgive them. He heard this. And when the centurion, which which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. He'd watch many hang on a tree, suffer and die. But something's different about this one. This one truly This is the Son of God. When someone watches you not only withhold vengeance, but now you're you're pouring out good. You're feeding the enemy. He's thirsty. You give him drink. You have opened the door for something that is of supernatural caliber. There's a lot of uncertainty, of course, about the expression, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Some of you have this like, whoa, that's what I'm going to do. My enemy, I can't wait. I'm going to do good and I'm going to burn his head. That's not really the idea here. Okay, possibly the best basic understanding of the expression is taken in the sense, for by doing this, he will become ashamed. I'm I'm ashamed. Heap coals of fire. There are some that understand it, that fire was the necessity of of this day and and to share your coals from your own fire. That, That certainly could be true. What we do come away with is we do understand we're to recompense to no man. Dearly beloved, you know, don't avenge yourself. God said vengeance is mine, I'll repay. So if he's hungry, feed him. Okay, this is, this is good for evil. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Good for evil. Here's what you're doing. You're heaping coals of fire on his head. An expression that people, many would have understood to mean like, oh, wow, he's going he's gonna to be personally ashamed. Wow, look at how they responded to me when when this is what I did to them. Once again, our goal is not to shame, but to help. To prepare the way for him to come to Christ. The result of your kindness may be that he's personally shamed, but our goal is restoration. And the last thing we see is we protect ourselves from being overcome. We protect ourselves. How does this chapter conclude? Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. The word overcome, it means to conquer. He's saying conquer evil with good. I find it refreshingly real that Paul never presents these truths as simple or easy, returning good for evil. We reason that if I don't look out for myself, my enemy will take advantage of me. And Paul is just saying this, listen, If God be for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, why worry about the one who is against you? 
You overcome evil with good. I read a story recently about a pastor who shared some of his personal struggles. A situation specifically that, that was evil being shown not just to him but towards his family. He wrote about this. Let me read what he said. Ministry doesn't get any easier after 46 years. Even after all that experience, I still have the occasional ulcer-generating church member determined to run me out of the pulpit. I've learned to shred anonymous letters before reading them and to ignore anyone who claims to speak for the silent yet powerful faction, oldest tricks in the church. But this one sought to hurt me through my family. That boiled my blood. And I was, I was on the verge of saying too much and going too far with my response. One day, my wife heard me unloading the verbal truck about the situation over the phone to a close friend. When the conversation ended, I hung up and slumped back in my chair. She'd been downstairs when she heard me and came to the bottom of the stairs. I heard her ask rather quietly, can I say something? I got up from my desk, walked to the stairway, sat down on the top stair and said, yeah, let it go. She stood there looking up, staring. Let it go. Her words flew up the stairs and pierced me through the heart. I heard your voice. I heard your tone. And I heard your volume way down here. Come on, honey. Let it go. Wise words from a concerned wife. She wasn't concerned about me doing anything wrong or offending anyone or even my taking any particular action. None of that mattered. She was concerned about what my resentment was doing to me. Deep, down inside, I needed to let it go. I did. And then he went on and he said, Neil Anderson wrote, forgiveness is agreeing to live with the consequences of another person's sin. You're going to live with those consequences whether you want to or not. Your only choice is whether you will do so in the bitterness of unforgiveness or the freedom of forgiveness. As long as you hold on to a wrong done to you, you will be overcome by evil. And you will be victimized by the very thing you're trying to get rid of. So you have only one choice. It's uncomplicated, anything but easy. But learn from my experience. Let it go. You know, the real point of our passage is that we extend to others what God has already extended to us. That last verse, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't be conquered by evil. Conquer evil with good. Have you ever thought about the fact that no matter how much darkness there is, light always wins. Darkness has no power over light. This then is the message which we have heard of him. Declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In like fashion, good is greater than evil. It overcomes. To fight darkness with more darkness makes absolutely no sense. You need something else, something different to fight darkness. And God explains to us what it is. It is his goodness, his goodness available to you as you present your bodies a living sacrifice to him, which is good and acceptable and reasonable service. It keeps us from being conformed to this world and instead transforms us by the renewing of our minds. The result? We become living, breathing proof to that which is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Church, have you made space for the wrongdoing of others? Are you willing to live with the consequences of another person's sin so that you don't create additional consequences for yourself? It doesn't mean that you let someone else off the hook. It does mean that you commit them into the hands of the righteous judge. Are you prepared to stop trying to fight darkness with more darkness? 
It doesn't work. Instead, by God's transformative power, will you ask him to help you fight the darkness and do so in the power of his light. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus. This is Rejoice in the Lord.